Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friends of the Library's Fall Program, Writing for Young Readers, The Success of the Babysitter's Club, and Other Publishing Phenomena. I am honored to serve as moderator for this evening's conversation among our distinguished panelists, best-selling author Anne M. Martin, Smith Class of 1977, and legendary publishing professionals Jean Fywell and Liz Sabla. I look forward to what I know will be a lively and engaging conversation among our three panelists. So here is our plan for our time together. The panelists will converse for about 45 minutes, and then we will have time for questions from you. There will also be a reception and a book signing to follow, as Jenny mentioned. So I'd like to start now with a few words of introduction for each of our esteemed panelists. Jean Fywell's career was forged first at Avon Books and then at Scholastic as the architect for their trade publishing program from 1983 to 2005. She is best known for her invention of Anne M. Martin's Babysitter's Club and the publishing of Goosebumps, Animorphs, Harry Potter, and other best-selling series. In 2006, Ms. Fywell joined Macmillan as Senior Vice President and Publisher, where she founded Fywell and Friends. Her first book at Fywell and Friends was Nancy Tillman's On the Night You Were Born, which now has over six million copies in print. Her most recent bestsellers include The Lunar Chroni Chronicles and Renegades by Marissa Meyer, the works of Anne M. Martin and Catherine Applegate, Andy Griffith's Treehouse series, and Jimmy Fallon's Your Baby's First Word Will Be Dada, and Everything is Mama. In 2007, she founded Square Fish, a paperback program known for its innovative repackaging. Jean Fywell was named publishing director of Henry Holt Books for Young Readers in 2009 and in 2013, she launched Swoon Reads, a groundbreaking crowdsourced imprint. Liz Zabla is associate publisher of Fywell and Friends, an imprint of the Macmillan Children's Publishing Group, where she edits picture books through young adult fiction and works with new and established talent. Among the books Ms. Zabla has edited are the number one New York Times best-selling Lunar Chronicles series by Marissa Meyer and other New York Times bestsellers, including the Summoner series by Taryn Mathrew, Wolf in the Snow by Matthew Cordell, winner of the 2018 Caldecott Medal, Wish Tree by Catherine Applegate, and Rain, Rain by Anne M. Martin. Anne Matthews Martin, distinguished Smith alumna, class of 1977, was born in Princeton, New Jersey, the daughter of New Yorker cartoonist Henry Reed Martin and preschool teacher Edith Martin. At Smith, Anne majored in psychology and education and child study, graduating with honors. For those Smithies in attendance, you may like to know that Anne lived in Gardner House all four years. After Smith, Anne taught eight and nine-year-old children in a combined fourth-fifth classroom in a Connecticut school. And after teaching for a year, she found her way to work for, project, for Pocket Books, excuse me, Bantam, and then for Scholastic Inc., her longtime principal publisher. Anne's work has been published since by Firewell and Friends, an imprint of the Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. Anne is the best-selling author, as we all know, of the Babysitter's Club series and the Main Street series. It was 1985 when Anne wrote the first book that launched the Babysitter's Club series while she was working for Scholastic as a children's book editor. The widely successful Babysitter's Club series, also known as BSC, published between 1986 and 2000, sold 176 million copies, and in the end included over 300 different books, counting all the series. Anne's other novels include the 2003 Newbery Honor Book, A Corner of the Universe, Belle Teal, A Dog's Life, and Rain Rain, which won the Dolly Gray Children's Literature Award in 2016. Anne's most recent book is Missy Piggle Wiggle, 
and The Sticky Fingers Cure, the third of three books inspired by Betty McDonald's Mrs. Piggle Wiggle series. Please indulge me for a moment with the addition of a personal note here. I am proud and honored to call Ann Martin my Smith classmate, class of 77. We took a couple of education and child study courses together while here at Smith and student taught at the same time our senior year. I remember my excitement when I learned of Ann's success as the author of the famed Babysitter's Club and of course I introduced Anne's writing to my college students of children's literature as well as to my own daughter Nell. Nell became a fast fan of author Anne Martin, who doesn't, and devoured every Babysitter's Club book she could get her hands on, inspiring her to take the Babysitter's class offered through our local hospital. So fast forward to 1997, our 20th reunion at Smith. I knew that Anne would be attending reunion, and so I invited my daughter Nell, then 10 years old, to join me for our class dinner. As Nell and I were climbing the stairs to the Davis Ballroom where our class dinner was being held, I spotted Anne at the top of the stairs talking with her good friend and classmate, Claudia. <laughs> Claudia was the inspiration for the BSC character, Claudia Lynn Kishi club position, vice president. <laughs> so I introduced my daughter Nell to both Anne and Claudia, and Nell, in a state of total awe, shook Claudia's hand and remarked with great certainty, Claudia, you've cut your hair. <laughs> After shaking Anne's hand as well, Nell turned to me and said, do not ask me to wash my hands now or ever again. <laughs> so Anne, thank you for the important and enduring inspiration your work has given and continues to give children and young adults throughout the past 30 plus years. We are all so delighted to welcome you back to Smith this evening. And I'd like to launch the conversation now with the first question to you, Anne, a question that I'm guessing many Smith students and alums in the audience are musing as well. I'm going to move over to my spot next to you and uh, ask you the question. So, Anne, please start off by reflecting on your Smith years. Oh my God. What were some of the highlights of your years at Smith? How did Smith inspire you? And how did you begin to walk your professional path beyond the gates of Smith, the journey that has taken to you to where you are today? Well, first of all, I have to say that most of my um, closest friends outside of publishing friends are um, the women that I met at Smith. We're all still very good friends, Claudia included. Um, <laughs> And so that was probably one of the most important things, the friendships and the um, relationships that were forged here. Um, the professors that I had, um, I actually only took one writing class, although it was uh, memorable. Um, most of my classes were to fulfill the um, majors, my majors, which were education and psychology. And um, though I have used um, the things that I learned in my classes then in most of my writing, especially in the Babysitter's Club series. Um, oh, my goodness. And my student teaching led me to um, teach the next year, but I was already, um, you, I was already uh, very interested in children's literature and um, used children's literature heavily in the classroom that year. So I felt that everything was sort of coming together and it seemed like a... Um, a, a good next step to uh, to go into publishing, but to stay in the ch uh, field of children's books. So, yeah. And Jean, we know that it was you at Scholastic who asked Anne to write the first Babysitter Club book in what you imagined then would be a series of four books, I believe. Uh, would you reflect on those early days of the development of the Babysitter Club series and in your reflections, tell us a little bit about why you chose Anne to be the writer. Um, you know, I think in the beginning at Scholastic, um, I was developing a trade publishing program. Scholastic was known primarily as a book club. Um, and so it was my job to come up with ideas um, that we could publish 
And there was this little book called Ginny's Babysitting Job that the book clubs were offering. And every time they offered it, it was the best-selling book on the list. And there was no reason why. It was on the fourth page of the off offer and usually not heavily promoted. But it always sold the best. And I said, there must be something about babysitting that is appealing to people. Um, and Anne had just left Bantam. Yes. Or, no, I had just left Bantam, yeah. Um, and she had published three or four hardcover novels, and I felt somehow that this was a match made in heaven. She was a thoughtful, um, serious writer, but she also has a wicked sense of humor. <laughs> um, so I felt that, you know, she had the right skills, and, you know, she would come up with something something great. And the rest is history, right? And the rest is history. <laughs> so Liz, thank you, Jean. Tell us about your trajectory working with Anne as her longtime editor. What excited you about her writing then and now? Well, I was, I was lucky enough to start at Scholastic and jump right into a book that Anne was working on with Paula Danziger, a very legendary children's writer. And it was a, a job and assignment a project i inherited and the new kid you know i took it and i was very lucky to have it but i was pretty um i was floored and i was intimidated um by the idea of working with you <laughs> yes and so i thought well <laughs> i will just have to you know knock this out of the park but uh, much to my surprise, and, and of course to Jean's surprise, after the books with Paula Danziger were finished, Anne talked about having an idea for a standalone, more literary, non-series novel. And I felt like I saw the light bulb over her head and it went off over mine too. I'm, I've always been um, attracted to projects in which authors, creative people are changing lanes, trying something different, going outside their comfort zones. And it was very exciting. And so I got to work on it with Anne. And you've continued the journey together. Yeah. Uh, let me just say something about the Babysitter's Club. It was published monthly. So Anne's schedule, Anne did not have a life and just wrote books. And so the idea of her wanting to write a novel where she had the time and to really consider and work on it, I think really was appealing and attractive. <laughs> well, and there was something else too, though. There, there were, um, I would say, the, the benefit and the drawback to the writing the series was the same thing, same characters over and over again. Um, the benefit was that if you really love these characters that you're writing about and you, you, you feel close to them and you've been writing about them for a long time, you don't have to say goodbye to them at the end of each book. But on the other hand, I, I didn't feel that I was stretching myself very much anymore. I wanted to create new characters. Um, uh, creating characters is my favorite part of the writing process. Um, and I wanted to um, write about um, uh, a slightly different time. I, Beltiel was set in the 60s. Uh, also, <laughs> not too long after Beltiel was published, um, a child said to me, so now you're writing historical fiction? <laughs> and <laughs> I said, well, actually, it was just my own childhood. But, um, but it was fun to, to not to be writing something other than a contemporary novel to create new characters. And so it felt like even though I had enjoyed the Babysitter's Club um, very much, it felt like the right next step. So actually, this is a, a good moment to pick up on your, your description of how much you love to develop characters. One of your hallmarks as a writer, Anne, is that you do not and have never shied away from presenting common struggles and challenges in your book for children and young adults. And you confront everyday problems uh, such as sibling rivalry, peer conflicts, jealousy, parents' divorce and remarriage, illness, alcoholism, disabilities, autism, schizophrenia, and many more. These topics invite your readers to feel great empathy and understanding for your characters. 
So if you would talk to us a little bit about your process as you're creating your story narrative and especially your characters. So who, and I'm just gonna throw out some questions and you can just pick and choose among, you, among them. Who and what inspire you? What energizes you? What exhausts you? What makes you laugh? What makes you cry? What do you read when you're writing and developing your characters? Oh my goodness. Um, well, first I'll, I'll uh, talk about my writing process, which is generally the same for each book, but not exactly the same. Um, I love to outline. Um, I'm, I, my outlines go through many stages, as Liz and Jean know. Um, I, I start off with a, a little, what I call a framework outline, which is just a page long with maybe a sentence or two um, about what might happen in each chapter, so I know where the flow of the story is going, and then I expand on it, and I have um, character um, profiles, and, um, and I love doing, but this is just my own process. Some writers don't like to outline at all. The two books that I wrote with Paula Danziger, um, were very different because Paula didn't like to outline at all and in fact refused for us to have outlines on either books. And I thought, wow, this is actually really freeing. And then as soon as I started working on Belle Teal, I went back to outlining again because it just, it feels more comfortable to me. Um, I show um, Liz um, the outline when I'm comfortable with it and that's a, um, a, a point um, at which we can make changes. Um, when I start writing, I usually show the, um, the manuscript to Liz in thirds. Um, again, just to sort of keep myself on track. Um, so that, that's the process. I like to, I like to have um, Liz and Jean involved. I don't like to have anybody else involved. I don't like to read my work to other people at the end of the day or anything. Um, what were some of your other questions? <laughs> Just uh, to talk a little bit about your development of characters. Okay. Often the characters come to me before I even have a story to go with the characters. That's how Rain Rain started. Um, I was envisioning um, this young girl who was living um, sort of on the outskirts, both literally um, and figuratively, um, with a, a parent who um, didn't understand her very well and who has some very quirky um, obsessions or interests and but I had no story to go with this I just knew that I was falling in love with this character um, and well I'll just tell you how Rain Rain evolved um, because I met with um, I forget which book I had just written. I didn't know what to write next. I had this idea for this character, Rose, and I met with Liz and Jean, and Jean wanted another book about a dog. Um, and I'd already written two, and I didn't really want to write another one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, right around the, the, that time, um, uh, Hurricane Irene hit. Uh, did Hurricane Irene was that bad here? This was after Hurricane Sandy, and it was it um, affected my area. I live in the Catskills, and it affected it um, um, quite badly. There were entire little towns that were washed away, and um, I still had a dog at that time. And as I would walk her up and down the street, thinking about Rose and looking at the devastation, um, all of these things came together for. Um, rain, rain, and then I think I presented the idea um, to Liz and Jean. So that's sometimes the stories just, you know, things happen and it, everything comes together to form a story. But I don't know. I mean, I could never have predicted that. I mean, I think the thing about her character development and story development and rain, rain, whenever you know we were presenting it, I felt compelled to say the dog doesn't die. <laughs> You're gonna, this is a very unusual story that takes a, a different twist than you think it's gonna take. And that's what was so brilliant about this book. Thank you. Um, Liz and Jean, would you both tell us a little bit about what drew you to the field of children's publishing? Yes, it was completely random. <laughs> Um, at the time, I was, my first job was at Avon Books, and I worked for the, my first job was for the managing editor, who operates as kind of the hub in a publishing company 
uh, the manuscript goes from you know manuscript to book under the managing editor's eye. Um, and it was a great vantage point from which to view publishing. Um, and the first editorial position that came open was for children's books. And my mother was a teacher, my grandmother was a teacher, so I had kind of an affinity for children's stuff. Um, and I just thought, I'll try this. Um, I took the job as an assistant. My boss was fired two months later, <laughs> and they promoted me. So I think they promoted me because they figured, what harm can she do? I mean, she's <laughs> not, um, and they weren't that interested in the children's books, and, and that's how it started. And I started my career, I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area, started my career in independent bookstores in, when I was still living in the Bay Area. And as they were great independent bookstores with real down and dirty children's sections where you know people came in and kids were on the floor and books were strewn all over and people would come in and say, I'm looking for a book for my granddaughter who's seven and likes horses. And because I also, my parents were teachers and I was around a lot of books, I was recommending things that I had liked when I was seven and liked horses. But it opened, being in a bookstore, seeing the new books coming in opened up a whole new level of appreciating children's literature and I got to follow what was new. When I ended up moving to New York, I started out in scientific and technical publishing <laughs> and it wasn't my dream job, but I, I learned a lot and learned the basics and it was through um, a friend of mine from Berkeley, from one of those bookstore jobs that I got a connection to my first children's publishing job and from there, I went to Scholastic and worked with Jean. So Liz and Jean, you've seen many changes and developments uh, in children's publishing throughout these trajectories as you've described them. So what do you see as the perennial strengths and impact of Anne's writing uh, on her readers over these 30 plus years? And Anne, don't be modest. We know you're very modest. Feel free to jump in here um, in terms of your own assessment of your work as well. I mean, I want to say something that when, you know, we worked on the Babysitter's Club, we would have, we had no idea of the impact it would have. Um, our lives are in the Babysitter's Club, you know, our grandparent dying, a dog dying, our friendships, our rivalries, that's in the Babysitter's Club. I can point to many situations in there that are my own, that are Anne's own, you know, so that's why it is absolutely authentic and, and true. Um, but about 10 years ago, I guess it was, you know, when Anne would come with us and sign her most recent book, there started to be a wave of Babysitter Club fans who would come with their dog-eared copies um, weeping and saying, you know, you changed my life. I'm a librarian because of you. I'm a teacher because of you. And it was an amazing experience. It was just, you know, so moving and profound for us. Um, but it was not, you know, I didn't arc it out and say, you know, I'm gonna affect that next generation. What are they <laughs> doing? And I would add to that in terms of Anne's standalone novels that her, her talent and the reason that books like Belle Teal and A Corner of the Universe are still so widely read and now part, part of many, many young readers' lives is that Anne has a very special talent for writing about that corner of the universe that matters to kids. She's not trying to paint the, she doesn't paint in broad strokes. She's an intimate, authentic writer who builds characters that kids can see themselves in, but she, she keeps it to, to a scale that is very difficult to achieve. And she does, it, she does it very well, and I think that is absolutely perennial and will remain so. Well, uh, um, I guess the only thing I'd like to add is that um, uh, I still receive letters um, now they're more from adult readers, but um, from kids. And the letters that I did receive um, from kids at the height of the Babysitter's Club um, 
we're mostly apt to start off by saying, um, I like all of the characters in your books, but I most like Claudia because, or I most like Stacy. And I think that one of the things that kids were um, relating to in the stories were the characters, and they were able to find themselves or their friends in the books, and um, that helped to pull them into the series. I mean, we, we didn't realize how much children would identify with the characters when the series was first being developed and we, you know, we advanced, we early on were advancing time. So Stacy, we moved her out and to California and we got a flood of letters <laughs> saying, you idiots, what are you doing? <laughs> Stacy's a great character and I'm like, you know, I'd never done this before, I hadn't done a series. So I had no idea what I was doing, and we basically had to bring Stacy back. <laughs> and then everybody stayed where they were for three years and didn't have birthdays. Did you notice there were no birthdays? And we had to stop time, and that sort of set the template for series publishing, is that you want to do more books and you're publishing monthly. These characters can't grow. Let they were 13. Know, that was one of the, the drawbacks to the series, that they couldn't, um, they couldn't grow emotionally because they weren't aging physically. And in fact, when, I, um, when Jean came to me with the idea for Main Street, um, I wanted the characters to age, and they did a little bit. It was a much shorter series. There, I think there were only 10 books in the series, but the characters did age a couple of years, and it felt, um, it felt more right somehow to have the characters grow. Yeah. So in thinking about this um, concept of timelessness, I guess I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the graphic novels by Raina Telgemeier, uh, her contemporary adapta adaptations of the Babysitter Club books. So children's librarians, librarians have told me that these graphic no novels based on Anne's beloved books are among the top 10 most requested books of today. They fly off the library shelves. So this does speak, I would say, to the timelessness of your work, Anne. So what are your thoughts about uh, the adaptation of Anne's work in these graphic novels? Um, I think they're wonderful. I have to say I had not been, um, not that I wasn't a fan of graphic novels, they were just sort of off my radar. And um, when uh, David Levithan, who's um, the editor of the graphic novels at Scholastic, suggested that um, we publish the books as graphic novels, I thought, David's usually right about these things. So I thought, that's fine. And then, then he came um, to me with um, some of Raina Telgemeier's work. And it was just wonderful. It seemed perfect for the books. Um, and it was a great fit. I think that um, the graphic novels are a, a wonderful way to pull um, um, new readers into the, into the books, and then hopefully they'll find their way to um, the other books and to all you know, other kinds of fiction. Um, but Raina, Raina's um, work has become so popular, her own work. She um, wrote Sisters and Ghosts, um, drama. drama, Smile. Um, and so Raina actually has had to turn the reins over to um, her protege, who's uh, Gail Galligan, who's just fabulous too. But um, no, I, I think they're wonderful. It's a really fun new take um, on the series. And the, each book is based on one of the existing books, so they're very true to the, um, to the stories that already exist. And I'll just add that I love what's happened with graphic novels in our world as readers, and especially for young readers. One thing that has changed a lot is that when I was, again, starting out and working in independent bookstores, graphic novels and comics were, were in that corner, and sort of special people, meaning adult men, read them, and, and they weren't considered real books. And I remember being at a conference and having picked up a graphic novel, and a, a bookseller I knew from a different town said, oh, you're really you know, working hard here doing your reading. And I, I was enjoying it so much. And what I, so what I love now is that graphic novels that we've always known that how appealing they are, what a gateway to reading they are for certain readers of all ages. And I'm so glad that they're 
accepted and that librarians are saying they're among the top 10 titles because I have really seen that change. So I'd, I'd like to highlight another timeless contribution, <clears throat> excuse me, of your work, Anne, and that's your creation of the Lisa Libraries uh, to honor the memory of your friend and colleague. So 28 years later, right, from the time you... Uh, yeah. yeah. The Lisa Libraries continue um, in its mission to get new books into the hands of children in underserved areas. So would you tell us about the Lisa Libraries and how you created and continue to nurture? Sure. Um, yeah, we started in um, 1990 in order to honor and uh, memorialize a publishing colleague um, who had died and she had, I, I had worked with her at Bantam Books in the children's department and she was very passionate about children's literature. And um, so when she died, several friends and I were trying to find a way to honor her and we decided to create um, what was in a tiny little organization called the Lisa Libraries. We, it, its mission is very um, easy, simple. We, we ask um, publishers, editors, authors, reviewers, um, uh, agents to send us their um, extra copies of new books and we organize them um, into small libraries that can be given to um, kids in underserved areas that um, we've their libraries that have been established in um, shelters for um, homeless families or battered women and their children um, in prison visiting areas for children of incarcerated parents um, and also many, many of the kids have, of the books have been sent home individually with um, kids, especially in the foster care system. So we started out tiny in my second bedroom in my apartment in Manhattan, and now we have um, a much bigger space in Kingston, New York. And um, we send out thanks in large part to Jean and Liz and other um, publishers who are very generous with their donations of books to us. We send out um, thousands of books to um, uh, kids who probably would, or who might not have access um, to new books every year, so. So wonderful. That may be an effort, if I may plug uh, the Lisa Libraries for our Smith students who are eager to pursue um, internships and praxis. And sure, yeah, yes, we can always that'd be great. help. Do you hear yes. that, Smithies? <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a question for all of you. What makes you hopeful about the state of children's book publishing today? Well, I, I think that, I think there's a lot of innovation. I, and I think that it is basically a collegial and gracious and happy industry. That's not to say it's not competitive. This is a business. We're not running a daycare center like the, but um, I think the people in it are very dedicated and committed um, to publishing great books, to publishing a wide range of, of great books, and um, I, like, I, I like being in our industry. I feel um, it is headed, you know, in a positive direction. I agree with that, and I think that, you know, as people talk about the competition for readers' attention, um, I feel feel committed and happy about the content that continues to be developed and, and put out into the world by the children's publishing industry. And the health of the industry, the relative health of the industry, points to the fact that that content has appeal. And it is competing with screens and television and all kinds of things. And as a content person, I'm just so happy to see it continue. As Jean said, to be there are innovations and new talent coming all the time, and um, it it just it grows all the time. Well, I'm also just <clears throat> excuse me, just very heartened um, when I'm working at the Lisa Libraries every week to see um, the constant demand for children's books. Um, to see that these organizations that um, have so little and are looking for things to offer for kids want um, books to give them. Um, and because we, we had worried um, at a certain point a few years ago that the demand for books might go down and we haven't seen that at all. In fact, it seems to be increasing. So that's a good sign. 
It is really amazing to see your newsletter from the Lisa Library, or to read stories about kids who are owning their first book and how incredibly, incredibly special that is. And that says a lot. Very heartening. Uh, what might you like to see more of in terms of content in, in children's writing? I mean, I think that there is a demand for a much more inclusive and diverse range that is not only stories that are being told, but just people of color in books in a way that is just their part of the population. This has not been the case, and I think we've been addressing this for the last 10 years, but must, much more focus in the last two years. Um, and it's, there's a, still a ways to go. What needs to happen, do you think, to move that forward? Well, I think, I think it has to, there have to be different people making the decisions. I think there has to be education. I think, you know, we, we are doing a whole drafting thing of looking for talent in colleges and, you know, um, but the complexion of publishing has to change. And I think also getting back to, to the bookstore beat, I think accounts and retailers and anybody doing the selling has to understand there's a market and the market isn't just one color. So I'm going to shift a little bit. Um, still talking about uh, the field of um, children's writing, publishing, editing. but. Um, for all of us Smithies and current students as well as alums in the audience this evening, the three of you serve as incredibly strong and successful models of women who've made it in the field of children's writing and uh, publishing. So to just change this path of the conversation for a moment, I'd like to talk about the important role of risk taking in the workplace, especially for women and underrepresented minorities and people of color. A topic we are talking about a lot in higher education across these United States is the importance of encouraging students to take risks in their learning and to support them in their risk taking. And we know that women are told time and time again that they are afraid to take risks. So at Smith today, we're talking a lot with our students about risk taking, resilience, and resourcefulness as lifelong pursuits. I've been talking about them as the new three R's. And one of our distinguished alums, Shelley Lazarus, is fond of saying, when you're really scared, that's the time to take a risk. So would you talk a little bit about risk taking, especially as it relates to your own professional trajectories in the field of children's writing and publishing? And you know, your own personal stories in terms of that um, domain, if you will. Um, you know, there was an article written about me a long time, maybe like 10 years ago, and the theme was troublemakers in publishing. <laughs> um, and I don't consider myself a troublemaker, but I consider myself a person who asks questions and doesn't accept the status quo. I mean, I, I always loved children's books, and I loved developing ideas, and there was nothing that wasn't possible as far as I was concerned. And um, I told Susan that I had been at Scholastic 22 years and I was fired at 22 years. And it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me because um, I was really unhappy there, but I didn't realize it and I was afraid to leave um, because you know I was so at home and I had developed so many things. Um, but it was very freeing to start over and be able to do the you know work I've done at Macmillan and develop you know a new imprint and take some of the authors that I developed at Scholastic and represent them in new ways and new career and I think the only way you can be successful is to not be afraid to fail you have to fail a little to be successful because otherwise you're just paralyzed you're just feeling like I can only do a phenomenal success you know that's the only success there is. There are little successes, and that all amounts to, you know, many, many different careers. Um, 
Thank you. And then I think there's, I, I agree with that, and I think there's a, an, a different kind of experience too. There was a speaker at my son's high school graduation who said something that really stuck with me. She said, resilience isn't magic, it's balance. And when I think about the risks that I've taken, they came from a, a slightly different place. When I first met Jean, it was through a friend who said, there's a job opening at Scholastic and you should come interview with Jean Firewell. And I was really happy where I was. I was at a small startup children's publisher doing the kind of hands-on work I really enjoyed, working with people I adored. And I said, eh, no, I, you know, I'm good. I'm good. And he said, well, you know, what do you have to lose? You should do it. It's good practice. So I thought, okay, that's fine. You know, it's not my, it wasn't my jam. I'm a total introvert. I'm not looking for, for opportunities to go out and meet people and talk to people. But what happened was I got, I got to the interview and within 10 minutes had that, oh my God, moment of, I really want this. I didn't know. I didn't, this was going to be a huge risk for me. Um, but I was at a place where, um, it, what, it did feel scary, but, but I, I knew it was right. It was, balance is, I think, also trusting your instincts and saying, you know, this does feel right. It feels right for a reason. And what can I, get, what, where can I go? This is appealing to me for some reason. And one of the greatest things that happened in that interview is I was very nervous to admit to Jean that there were certain things I hadn't worked on. I had never edited a novel. I was mostly working on picture books and books for younger kids. And I, and I finally got it out. You know, and I said, well, you know, it's like a confession. And Jean said, well, do you want to? And that was the moment I thought, this is, yeah, yeah, I do want to. I want to take that risk, and she's making it, she's making it safe. She's making it balanced, but she's also saying, just you know, go for it. That was a that was a huge turning point for me. Um, <clears throat> I think there are two points in my writing life when I felt that I was taking a big risk. The first time was when I left my my last full time job, which was at Bantam Books, and. Um, I think you and I had started talking about the Babysitter's Club, but we only thought it was going to be four books. And so I was taking freelance work, I was writing cover copy and editing stuff for packaging companies, and um, I had no idea how this was going to play out. Um, and in fact, when I left Bantam, my mother <laughs> said to me, well, so now when people ask me what you do, what do I tell them? <laughs> um, but it worked out, obviously. It led to the Babysitter's Club. And then the next time there was a risk, again, it was a matter of trusting myself because I felt that um, when it was time to leave Bantam, I just knew that it was the right time. And, um, and then um, about 15 or so years later, I wanted to end the Babysitter's Club series and I don't think anybody else wanted to. I remember telling Jean and another publishing colleague and you all just sort of put your heads in your hands. Um, <laughs> But I just felt it was time. We, I felt I was running out of stories, and I, I wanted to write Bell Teal and other kinds of books, and I knew that that was going to be a risk, too. I wasn't sure how they were going to be um, received um, in the um, literary community. Um, the Babysitter's Club books were considered just a series. Um, just a series. <laughs> but I... I felt that I had other stories to tell, and I felt very supported by Jean and Liz, and um, that was a good way to take a risk. So, so uh, I've heard embedded in your comments tonight uh, the role that mentors have played, especially among the three of you um, in your professional journeys. And now that I would imagine you find yourselves um, in the mentor role uh, very often in your work, what do you think about when you're mentoring someone? So what guides you in your mentoring work? I, I think um, I love what I do. And I love working with the people I work with. And that's, it's easy for me to convey that. So there's no, there's no step program that I have to 
go through. I enjoy talking to people who are interested in publishing. Um, and I want to create the interest for in the next generation. So if someone comes to me and they're interested in children's books, I am happy to talk to them. And, you know, sort of the industry is populated by people who have worked at Scholastic, who have worked with me, worked with Liz. Um, it's amazing to see all of them. And um, I, think, I think that's my legacy. That's, that's awesome. And it's certainly exciting when, when new college graduates or interns are amazing. Um, I think the last few hires we've had started as interns for us. And um, it's, it's wonderful to see people come in and for me to hear their points of view about things that we've both read, things that we're considering, classic children's literature, and get a very fresh and very different per perspective. It, that never gets old. I mean, that is the thing. It's not, I don't hire mini-me's. I hire to my weakness. I hire people who are not like me. And, you know, the people who are coming in are, are definitely bringing a different point of view. And, and that is, that's what keeps it fresh. That's what keeps what we do fresh. And I don't feel like that I play the mentor role in the same way that, um, Jean and Liz do, but um, I do enjoy supporting um, and encouraging uh, new authors. So. so, perfect segue. What advice do you have for the aspiring writers, editors, and publishers of children's books in the audience this evening? What would you give them as well, I'll advice? I'll start, and I bet you can guess what I'm going to say. Get a job in a bookstore. It's a great way to learn about the industry, and I, there is not a day that's gone by in the 35 years or so since I worked in bookstores in the Bay Area that I don't think about something that I did in those days. It, it, if you love books, it's a hands-on, all-encompassing experience, and I think it's been invaluable for me. Also, if somebody comes in, somebody comes in for an intern position or a full-time position, I tend, if they have a bookstore experience, I do, or even publishing internship experience, but especially bookstore experience, I can't even tell you where they went to school, but I can tell you what bookstores they worked in. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Well, a very practical um, piece of advice, especially if you want to write for children, is to join SCBWI, which is the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. It's um, an invaluable resource. It's a chance to, they have regional meetings all over the um, country all year long. It's a chance to meet um, uh, editors, publishers, agents, um, to hear presentations. I think sometimes to have your work read by editors, is that? I've acquired from you those have. conferences, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's my main piece of advice. And if you're a young writer, I mean, or a new writer starting out and you've maybe written a manuscript or two, um, don't be afraid to stretch your wings and try other things. Um, and well, and I'll, I could sort of go on and on, but when you start writing, um, it's important to find um, the voice that you want to tell the story with. And um, I think it's important just to experiment and experiment. Um, when I was trying to find the voice for um, A Dog's Life, which was the first of the dog, dog books, and it was told from the point of view of a dog, I rewrote the first few chapters several times trying to find the right voice for a dog. And so I think experimenting is also really important. I think if you're going to be an editor, then reading is essential. Just read and read and read. You should read in the industry. You should read, you know, backlist. And because if somebody comes into my office and they say they're interested in children's books and I'm, what have you read? And it's like, well, I. Charlotte's Web, but I haven't read anything since. You're out of my office. It's, you know, that's, that's a thing. Thank you. Great advice. So in closing our conversation tonight, is there a question you wished I had asked you? Or a question you'd like to ask each other? Well, I'm glad you asked about the Lisa libraries. That's what I always like to be asked. Oh, good. Um, I don't know. Um, So, 
So they invite your questions now. We have microphones set up on both sides. Um, both sides, and please approach the mic with your question, and just a point to consider when you're formulating a question, it's not a time to ask for professional advice concerning the writing that you may be doing. So we are inviting questions of a more universal nature regarding the professional work of our panelists, Anne's writing, um, and the field of children's books in general. So please ask away. Um, I have a question. How do we fight against the idea of girls' books and boy books and encourage kids to see themselves reflected in books but also read books about kids that are different genders than them and things like that? Well, I, I, have, to, I have very strong opinions about it. Um, but I, and it's a great question. It's a great question. I think a lot of it starts with the gatekeepers and educators, caregivers, parents, booksellers, librarians who are, set, who are handing, helping kids at first find books because they're, if you've ever seen a book fair, or again, you know, I know this is getting old, but working in a bookstore, little kids go for the cover that, that they're attracted to. It's okay if it's pink, if it's a boy, you know, they, they don't have the same filters. It's more that, well, you're not gonna like this, it's about a girl, you know? And I think, it, I think it starts with the gatekeepers and encouraging adults and educators to think about the interest of the child they're handing a book to, not the gender. I think there's long-standing prejudice on, in this area. Um, and we will sit at an art meeting, we'll show a cover, and someone will say, well, a girl's not going to pick that up. And I, you know, really? Do you know that? Is there some rule written somewhere that you got that? But it's implicit bias. It's, it's something that we've grown up with, and we just have to train ourselves not to think that way. But it is, it is deep. It is deep. But it's getting better, but not fast enough. Hi. Hi. This, oh. hi. Sorry. This is a question for Anne. Um, I, as a kid, really love the book that you co-wrote with Paula Danziger, P.S. Longer Letter Later. I read it like six times. Um, I would love to hear anything you want to share about what the writing process for that was like, since it was in letters, or maybe like the inspiration for the characters. I definitely like identify oh, okay. with both of them. Uh, well, first of all, um, P.S. Longer Letter Later is an epistolary novel. It told us an exchange of um, letters between uh, two best friends who have been separated. Um, one moves away, and the characters, um, Tara Starr and Elizabeth, were very much based on Paula and me. Paula was incredibly outgoing, um, very funny. Um, she was loud, she liked to be on stage, and I was completely the opposite, and that's how Tara Starr and Elizabeth were, so it wasn't too much of a stretch to write about the characters. And as I said before, Paula refused to have an outline. We did have a general idea of where the story was gonna go, but we, did, we also let it unfold through an actual exchange of letters. We were faxing them back and forth then, but um, so Paula would send me a letter and I would respond to it, and that's how the story unfolded. You're welcome. Hi, um, thank you so much for everything you've said so far. I was wondering, I'm really excited about a lot of the current middle grades and young adult books that are out, and I'm just wondering what are some that you all are particularly excited about, inspired by, et cetera. Thank you. We publish at Viwell a YA series called The Lunar Chronicles, and it started with a book called Cinder, which we published in, I think, 2011. And this was a first book by a debut author, and the agent's pitch um, was, was kind of gentle um, and a little generic, I'd have to say. I think she was just being very safe. It was a, the book is about a young woman who's a cyborg. 
and much, much more. But when I, and I thought from the pitch, eh, it's a high fantasy, or the outer space, it's not really my, my jam. And then I started reading it and thought, oh my God, it's a young woman Terminator. And, I, I, and that was something that I could really get behind, but not a Terminator, not in the, not in the super, super violent sense, but just a real badass who had to figure out basically how to save the world. And the series, Marissa is a terrific author, the series really took off, but then she has started all kinds of different things since then. So I really admire her, uh, her risk taking, I guess. I publish um, Andy Griffiths at Scholastic and at Macmillan. Andy Griffiths is an Australian writer who, um, the first book I published by him was called The Day My Butt Went Psycho. <laughs> um, and I really loved his irreverence and sort of subversive nature. Um, and he's done a new series called The 13 Story Treehouse um, books. And there's six of them so far. But what I like about him, and he's toured America, and every time he tours, he is very, he provokes the kids and makes them laugh and does things that I can see the adults in the room being really uncomfortable. <laughs> they're really, they're sort of looking like, when is he gonna stop that? That's not good. They're all getting riled up and um, there's just something genuine and funny and letting kids sort of be them themselves, their silly selves, and um, I really, I really enjoy his books. What are some uh, things that you've noticed uh, changing in the way that kids relate to the world? And I, I think you all um, really embrace universal characteristics, but have you, have, over the course of your career, have you seen kids be interested in different things or, or starting to change? And how are you, how do you keep a finger in what kids are interested in? I mean, I would say that lots has changed and some things have not changed. There are tried and true things in children's books that will always be um, appealing. I used to have an editorial philosophy called Blind Orphan Pony. Um, <laughs> really just hit a lot of the cores that kids wanted to know about. Um, but I think today, you know, there's a whole lot of world that the kids are sort of letting in and um, I think we have to be aware of the world and I think we have to be conscious and a lot of our books have to be conscious and can't just be about getting away. But um, there is definitely a balance we strike with, you know, what the world is and what, when they need to get away from the world. Um, I think one of the really great things about the Baby Sitters Club was that its willingness to handle things like divorce or mental illness or books like The Animorphs handled I, topics of war. And I think that recently there's been a big push to handle issues of gender and sexual orientation and race in children's books. So I was just wondering if you could talk about um, handling heavier topics for children. I, I think that, you know, Bruno Bettelheim said this, that, you know, you, you give kids sort of the world in as a, almost like a little bit of it, like an inoculation, the way you do with a vaccination. They need to be exposed to the world. Um, so I think this idea of protecting children and not exposing them is bullshit because I think the world is, you know, exposing them every day. So I remember with Harry Potter, um, there were comments about, you know, his parents are murdered. What, what are you thinking? This is a terrible thing. Or there are these things called dementors who are, you know, it's just very grim. And, you know, my feeling is that you don't present a world that has no hope. You don't present anything that is just, you know, relentless. But you do dose children with 
with what is real and what they should know and help them get through it with great books. And I think books are that for them. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add also with the Babysitter's Club, I felt that I was often taking cues from the readers um, or from, um, from young kids in the very beginning before I was uh, receiving letters from kids. Um, some of the, um, uh, one of the families that was divorced was based on um, a family that I knew when the kids were going through the divorce. Um, but then later, um, some of the ideas for the things that were included in the series came from um, kids asking for a book about something. And one of, one of the um, later books was called Marianne in the Memory Garden, and that came specifically because I had been getting a lot of letters about kids who wanted to see a book about the dangers of drunk driving and also a book about the death of a peer, which was something that we had not handled up until that point. And, those two ideas merged um, to form that book. So that came directly from the readers. And this will be the last question. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't see you. Oh, Julia, Julia, you the two two last questions. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't look to my left. Um, this question is for Anne. If you were writing, like, if you were writing the Babysitters Club today. Is there like a certain topic that, or multiple things that she would want to talk about that you like couldn't have talked about in 1990 or something? Probably. I mean, like we always have to be a little bit careful about how the ideas are presented because they are for basically eight to twelve-year-old readers. Um, so we couldn't. I don't think that there's some there's some topics I probably wouldn't address. Um, one of the things I liked best about the babysit the the kids, the girls who formed the Babysitter's Club, was that they were um, independent thinkers. Um, um, they had good ideas. They carried them out, usually without adult help. And I think that was all great. But I think maybe nowadays I would want them to be even maybe politically involved, um, to encourage young women to speak up for themselves, to stand up for themselves. In terms of specific topics, I'm not sure what I would address. It would be a conversation that I would have with my editors because these things are always a group experience. But I'm sure that there are things that would be different now. Julia. Um, I was wondering, like, who's, who would you say is the favorite um, babysitter and why? <laughs> um, I know exactly who the favorite one is. It's Stacy. Um, <laughs> I think Stacy was originally from New York City, so that made her very popular. She, um, she was sort of a fashion plate. Um, she also faced challenges. She, um, she had diabetes and she had to be concerned with that every day and she did face some challenges from that in a couple of the books. Um, so Stacy was hands down the favorite. With Claudia was a close second, but um, Stacy edged her out. Great questions. Thank you, everybody. And a very, very heartfelt thank you to you, Anne, Jean, and Liz for sharing your professional stories with us tonight and for being here with us tonight. We hope you come back. And uh, it was a really memorable evening. Thank you. Thank you. And to Friends of the Libraries for making this event possible.